Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, some second half bold predictions. The Wolves are exactly 50% of the way through their schedule. I'll give you two bold predictions and two maybe less bold, but still predictions for what's going to happen in the second half of the season. We'll also preview Wednesday night's Wolves-Pistons game. It's all upcoming on the show. Welcome in. You are Lockdown Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Hump Day. And happy Timberwolves game day. The Wolves are in Detroit to take on the Pistons tonight. We'll talk about that later in the show. First of all, though, a big thank you for making Locked on Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere that you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen, you can find this show. You can also download the Locked on Sports Minnesota app on either Roku or Amazon Fire TV. More great local sports coverage 24-7 and it's free. Download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app today on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked On T-Wolves. Don't forget the T and also at B-Beacon. And that's with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right. Uh, we'll get to Wolves Pistons a little bit later. That's uh, an interesting, it sh- shouldn't be that inter- interesting of a matchup, but we'll talk about it later. Um, and But I want to start with the midway point of the season. We are exactly 41 games through, and and I said this the other day on the show, if you had told me back in mid-October that the Wolves would be a game under 500 at the midway point, I would say, I probably would say, man, what happened to Carlton Towns? Did he, you know, what injury did he have? Well, that is what happened. Of course, the Wolves weren't playing that great when he got hurt either. Um, But I probably, like, I think you'd expect even more things to go catastrophically wrong, especially on the injury front, right? I mean, D'Lo's been mostly healthy. Rudy Gobert's been mostly healthy. Anthony Edwards hasn't missed a game yet, even though he's banged up now. Um, But the team just hasn't gelled and performed to expectations to this point, obviously. Um, So it's certainly a disappointing first half of the season. I want to give you a couple of predictions that are bold for the second half, and then a couple just kind of predictions that maybe aren't so bold, but I think we need to be realistic about what we think is going to happen in the second half of the season, too. Um, so let's start with, let's start with the less bold predictions, because, uh, I think there's still interesting topic topics to discuss. First of all, I don't think the Timberwolves will have anybody representing the team at all-star weekend. Um, I mean, no all-stars, right? Like Carl Anthony Towns has been hurt too much this season. He's hopefully going to come back before the all-star break, hopefully here in a couple three weeks. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle, getting to be in the middle of that four to six week initial timeline they'd given, although obviously he's not practicing yet, but he's not going to make the all-star team because of the injury, which is too bad. It's the second time in the last four years, third time in the last four years, the injury has impacted his ability to make an all-star team. Um, Rudy Gobert, I don't think will make the all-star team this year. I just don't like the numbers are, have dipped in terms of uh, year over year, his personal numbers, obviously the Wolves performance underperforming and fair or unfair, I think in the mind of certainly fans, but I think also even coaches and those who select the reserves, the price the Wolves paid for Gobert, even though it shouldn't impact it is going to, you know, impact the perception. I also do not think he should be an all-star this year. He's not playing at a, at a, you know, top 12 in the Western conference level or top, I guess 24 overall in the NBA level, right? I, I just don't think we're there. Um, so I don't think he'll make it. Anthony Edwards is going to be the Wolves' best shot, but he, even with his good season he's having so far and, and how well he's played lately, he's averaging 23.7 points per game. That's still just a shade outside the top 20 in the league in scoring. And if you're not in the top 20 in scoring, and that's what you're known for is scoring, it's going to be really tough to make the all-star team. Um, and again, to be clear, I don't think Edwards should be an all-star this year. I thought he would be, I I predicted before the season that he would be an all-star this season. I thought he'd have an outside shot at the third all NBA team, but it looks like we're still a year away. Um, and and, you know, last year in March, April, I guess late February, March and April regular and postseason, Edwards played an all-star level. Like if the all, if there was a second half all-star last season, all-star team, Anthony Edwards would have been on it. But they call they start the all-star voting at the end of the first half of the schedule. And Ant has not 
again this year. He's been better in the first half of the season than he was for most of the first half of last season. I think that that's true. So we could look at it as incremental improvement, right? He went from here. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm putting my hand, putting my hand to show where here is. And then here much higher, like a great second half of the season. And then now he's somewhere in between in terms of how he's played over the first 41 games of this season. So that's not an all-star level. I don't think the Wolves will have, you know, he's not going to do the dunk contest. Towns is hurt. He's not going to do the three point contest. I don't think, I think it's pretty unlikely he comes back to defend that crown given the injury. Um, you know, perhaps they find a way to find it, put a Wolves player in like the skills competition, but I don't think the, it'll be the first all-star break in a while that there's just zero representation of the Timberwolves. Um, I, unfortunately, I think that's where we're going to be at. So there's one kind of a, kind of a depressing prediction, but there we go. Uh, the second thing is I'm going to make a second half. Well, let's do, let's do a, a little bit of a bolder one. That's a positive. I think Carl Anthony towns will get to 40, 50, 90 for the first time in his career. I know he's out. Obviously I know his three point percentage is way down or sorry. I said 40, 50, 50, 40, 90 for the first time in his career. I, I like it's going to be difficult. That's why it's a bold prediction. Basically, he needs to shoot. If he shot, if he made 50 of his next 100 three point attempts, which he should get another 100 attempts this year. I mean, he got to 118 in 21 games or whatever he played. So he should get at least another 100 attempts. If he shot 50 for his next 100, he'd shoot about 41% for the year. So it's going to be tough. But I also, I talked about this on Tuesday's show. He shot like 20% on above the break threes with Rudy Gobert on the floor, which is just, the worst luck of all time. Like that's not sustainable um, in a, in a good way. As in like towns, isn't going to shoot that poorly when he comes back. Uh, he's going to shoot better. He's not a 32% three point shooter. He's a 40% three point shooter. So I think he'll come back. It'll swing the other way. He'll progress to the mean. And he always plays better in the second half of the season anyway. So I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a red hot Carl Anthony towns on the stretch of the season. He's already, he's going to shoot over 50% from the floor. Obviously, if he shoots 40% from three, he's going to shoot 50% from the floor. And he's got the best free throw percentage of his career to this point. Through 21 games, Cat is shooting 88.5% from the free throw line. I think those numbers rise across the board. It's a bold prediction. I get it. But I think 50, 40, 90 is a legitimate goal for Carl Anthony Towns this year. He's been, you know, 50, 40, 80 a couple of times, um, at least twice, actually, if not three times. I'm going to look at that now. Um, yeah, 50, 40, 80 twice. And he just missed it one year. He was 79.6 from three. Uh, I guess he did it last year too. So three times, uh, his three all-star seasons and he just missed it in the COVID shortened season. So he's already been a three time 50, 40, 80 guy. Um, he's done 50, 40, 85 once. And I think he's got a shot. I think he'll be 50, 40, 85. I think he's got a real shot at 50, 40, 90. Um, also related to Towns, another bold prediction. I think he finishes, I think he's going to make a run at a 25, 10, and 5 per game average. 25 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists. He's already averaging a career high 5.3 assists per game. I think that maintains. The scoring is going to go up. He's by far averaging his lowest per game scoring average since his rookie season at just 20.8 points per game. But he's going to get more opportunities. He's going to score more when he comes back. And I think he's been watching from the bench and seeing the Wolves struggle mightily on the glass, especially on the defensive glass. And he's going to come in guns blazing and is going to want to grab a bunch of rebounds and, you know, just play, you know, play extremely um, aggressively, I think, moving forward. I think we're going to see that from Towns. He's going to want to make up for lost time. And who knows? Maybe that ends up being detrimental. And the flip side of this is perhaps he tries to do too much and, and the shooting percentages don't bounce back and whatever. But I, I tend to think he's, as a strong second half performer in the season anyway, he's going to have relatively, like I'm sure the condition will have to come back, but he'll be relatively fresh. His body's not undergoing the wear and tear that it has so often. All those surgeries he had last year at the end of the season. And he's been able to kind of take a half step back and with perspective, see where the Wolves' biggest issues are. And I think he'll come in with the can-do spirit ability, the, the, you know, the rest that he's been able to have and also, he's going to want to propel this team to a playoff position, uh, to a strong, you know, with the playoffs period, but a, a good playoff positioning. So I think we're going to see a really strong second half from Carl Anthony Towns this year. I'm going to say 50, 40, 90. I'm going to say a serious run at 25, 10, and 5. And if he misses it, I bet it's rebounds, not points. I think he's going to get to 25 points a game. I think he will be a man on fire um, here as we as we end the season. 
All right. I've got two more predictions. Uh, one related to trades and another related to my actually year end. I'm going to revise my Timberwolves record prediction and where I think they'll finish in the West based on where they sit now halfway through the season. So we're going to do that here next. Today's episode of Locked on Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Prize Picks on Wednesday against the Pistons. I'm going to take Rudy Gobert rebounds over at Prize Picks. I think he's going to have his way against the Pistons front court on the glass. At Prize Picks, you can pick two to six players, and if they'll score more or less than their Prize Picks projections, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. You're not competing against other people either. It's just you versus the projections available. They offer projections on any sport that you watch. So you could cross sports, you could do MLB, uh, MLB, NBA, and NFL on the same night. You could do MLB if MLB was in season. You could do NHL and NBA on the same night if you are into watching both sports. Uh, any college sports, it, it's it's a ton of fun. And you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less. It really is that easy. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. For instance, if you deposit 100 bucks. Price picks will give you a hundred bucks. If you deposit 50 price picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars. All right. A couple more second half predictions. The first one trade related. I do not think the Timberwolves will trade D'Angelo Russell in the next month here. We're now within a month from the trade deadline. It's February 9th this season. I don't think D'Angelo will be traded. He's been in rumors going back to the offseason. There's been some more uh, tangible ones related to the Miami Heat of late. Uh, I talked on the show yesterday on Tuesday. If you want to hear some like legit trade talk, I got into the possibility of you know, like why I think Kyle Lowry is a better on-court fit for the Timberwolves than D'Angelo Russell. That's another topic. Listen to that show if you want to hear more about that. But even if D'Lo is not a perfect basketball fit for this team, I think, weirdly enough, and I think I even said preseason, I think I talked about, like, ah, oh, if the Wolves are hovering around 500 and had a disappointing season, look for him to be traded at the All-Star break. I'm going to flip that and predict now, even though they are hovering around 500 and a game below now, I don't think they trade D'Lo. Unless the wheels completely come off in the next month. I think it's pretty unlikely they trade him. And here's why. The Timberwolves have had so much change over the past, I don't know, forever. I think that Tim Connolly and Chris Finch, like I think Chris Finch, as much as there's, you know, so clearly some tension between D'Lo and Finch at times, as much like I really think Chris Finch would go to Tim Connolly in the front office and say, hey, guys, I want I want to have the same team for a little while here. Like last year, we were making progress. We won 46 regular season games. We pushed Memphis in the first round and then you flipped, you know, four of my eight rotation guys or whatever. Um, and and I, I obviously Finch was on board with the trade, but like the context of flipping out those players is the point here. Even if you think you can improve the roster from a basketball perspective is making another significant change in jettisoning D'Angelo Russell, who's an expiring contract anyway, worth it for whoever you can get back. Now, obviously it depends on what the return is clearly. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm saying this, blindly not knowing who potentially they could get in a D'Angelo Russell trade, but my money's on the wolves, not being able to get requisite value back for D'Angelo's expiring contract because he's not good enough for a really good team to want him on his contract, you know, to, to like shore up their bench for the playoffs on a max contract, right. Or to add to a starting lineup of a playoff team, because if D'Angelo was that good, then the wolves would keep him right. Like th that's not happening. So your best bet for trading him is a multi-team deal where you're taking back multiple salaries to make the match that are hopefully, you know, some are still expiring, maybe some aren't. I just think the Wolves are going to have a tough time freeing enough roster spots and taking back enough contracts to make this trade work from a salary perspective and also feel like the roster is getting better and you're not just like taking back essentially just contracts for the sake of contracts, right? When D'Lo's playing well, like we saw this last year, D'Lo was pretty good last year for most of the season, and he was part of this 46-win team. He was part of this, you know, obviously he struggled in the playoffs, but he was part of what the Wolves did last year. So I think they'd really have to, to you'd have to be able to make a case. Maybe they recoup a draft pick or two or something. I don't know how they would do that. It's more likely you have to attach a pick to D'Lo than it is you get one back, and obviously the Wolves can't trade a first-rounder. Um, but 
unless some team stepped up and for some reason wanted to give the Wolves a pick or there was a multi-team deal that Minnesota got a couple of expirings and a rotation, you know, shooter and uh, a serviceable point guard. Like, like, I think it's possible, but my prediction is that he's not traded. I don't think the Wolves want to rock the boat again. I think the Wolves want to see Towns and D'Angelo Russell play together. Remember, they were good the last couple of years together. Last year, they were like a plus 6.7 net rating as a two-man lineup, Russell and Towns. And this year, they struggled, but everybody struggled early in the season in the starting lineup because of implementing Rudy, right? Integrating Rudy is a, probably a better way to say that. Um, I think that the Wolves want to see Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell try and play together a bit more this season. I don't think it's likely D'Lo's back next year. I think the Wolves would have him back at a much lower salary, but you have to consider the upcoming Ant and Jaden McDaniels contract extensions. Um, and also I'm, I'm betting somebody all it takes is one team to want to pay D'Lo more money. And like, you know, you're not going to outbid anybody for D'Angelo Russell. Right. Um, so related, I don't think he's traded. I still think the Timberwolves find a way to get Patrick Beverly back here this season. I mean, Beverly's making enough noise behind the scenes, obviously it's being reported now in multiple places that Beverly wants to come back to Minnesota. He's obviously like probably would prefer the vibes of this still young and exciting and up and coming team. He's friends with ants and cat and all these guys, him and Finch got along great. And the Lakers are just kind of a fret times as depressing as the wolf situation has been. The Lakers are, are more so that way. Um, you know, I, I don't think the Wolves are trading for Patrick Beverly, but I think Beverly's moved in some attempt that the Lakers the Lakers try and make to become relevant this season. And then Beverly's bought out. I don't know how the Wolves are going to clear a roster spot. Um, actually, yesterday, January 10th, was the deadline for some contracts to become guaranteed for the Wolves, like Forbes and Rivers and others. Or not Forbes. Rivers, Noel, Nas Reed. I think there's one other one. So, I like... I don't know how the Wolves for the roster spot. They might waive Bryn Forbes. I mean, even though he's got a guaranteed contract, they might just straight waive somebody or perhaps they trade somebody for a pick. Like maybe it's Jalen Noel for a second rounder or something like that. Noel's going to be a free agent this off season anyway. So I, I really don't know that anyone would give up a second for him. Um, at this point, I don't think you're trading Nas Reed. I think the Wolves find a way to free a roster spot and then ultimately bring back Patrick Beverly. So maybe it's like a draft, like a trade trade deadline day. Like somebody gives a second for Jalen Noel, the Wolves, you know, pick up Beverly in a buyout situation, something like that. That's a prediction. No idea. Just what I think will happen. My last thing is related to my overall second half prediction for the Timberwolves. I think the Wolves will go, will finish with a 43 and 39 record, four games above 500. And they'll finish in the play in probably the seven seed again, maybe the eight seed, depending on how good the Western conference gets from a record perspective. Cause right now they're a game under 500 and they're, what tied for eighth. I think I lost my standings here. Um, tied. For, yeah. Tied for eighth in the West and they're a game under 500, but I think those records come up. Um, uh, that means the Wolves would have to go 24 and 17 in the second half, which is, would be nice. Like that's a good half schedule anyway. Right. Cause that's a 48 win pace for a season. Um, it's also though notable because the Wolves schedule in the second half is actually tougher than it has been in the first half of the season. So like we have to consider that. Uh, the Wolves, the strength of schedule for the Wolves remaining games is actually the sixth toughest in the league. They have opponent winning percentage as of right now is over 50% or I should say over 500 for the second half of the season for the Wolves. So the schedule gets a little tougher, but Towns will be back and hopefully will play in more than half of their second half games. So he'll outplay what he did in the first half. Rudy will obviously be more integrated into the team. And I think in general, the team will be more comfortable with each other and, and as a unit playing for Chris Finch, et cetera. So I'm predicting that the Wolves have a really strong second half, even against good competition. I think it looks a lot like last year's second half where the team gels. Maybe Beverly comes back, gives you a tiny boost. Uh, you have Towns back healthy. He's always a better in the second half of the season. I think the Wolves play stiff competition well. I, I, and they have really to this point in the season, right? Like the teams they've been beat badly by are mostly bad teams. Like the Wolves have played pretty well against good teams. Even that, like, remember they lost by a point to the Pelicans. They were competitive against the Bucks for three and a half quarters. Like the Wolves have played well against good teams, even without Carl Anthony Towns. So I think with him, they figure some stuff out. They have a really strong second half. They finish in the play-in, which of course, before the season, I remember saying on one of these, on one of the episodes early before August, September timeframe, Let's not even talk about the possibility of the Wolves being in the play-in because if they're in the play-in, the season's a massive failure. I don't know that I said the word massive because right now that doesn't sound too bad, right? With how bad they've been at times early this season, how disappointing it's been. 
but I still think this is a 43 win team. I think it's a play in team. Um, I think, and remember last year, the wolves won 46 and they were the seven seed. There's a chance 43 wins get you the seven seed this year because of just how congested things are in the middle of the West. Um, so I think they're 43 wins, seventh or eighth seed, maybe eighth seed in the West. And, uh, you know, it depends on who they play in the play in obviously, but we'll certainly be disappointing if that's the case, but given where they are right now, I think we'd take that outcome. Now, perhaps they go gangbusters in the second half and they end up in the top six where everybody thought they'd be. And they're peaking at the right time. That's all still on the table. It's all in front of us. Um, but I think the play in is the most likely outcome for this season. And of course the wolves, the roster is going to look different next year because the Delo thing and obviously Nas and Jalen Noel being free agents, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think that this year, even if it is disappointing, it's playing, it's 43 wins. You can build on that next year with the same nucleus of guys as an ant cat, um, and Rudy. So I think it is something to build on for next season. If, if that's where we end up. And obviously then it also depends on what happens in the play and in the playoffs. So, um, all that to say, that's my second half predictions. Um, let me know what you think. Let me know what you guys think about uh, the Wolves' second half record. But I, I do think they'll play better in the second half than they did in the first. And it's just a matter of like, what's this Western Conference look like when it's all said and done? All right, uh, let's close here today. I want to mention, uh, I want to do the Pistons matchup that uh, that uh, preview. There's also some midseason survey stuff at NBA.com, midseason grades. I want to hit on that really quickly. There's not actually not a whole lot of Wolves-related stuff, but I want to get through what they have on the Wolves. So we'll do that here next. Today's episode of Locked on Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro football to the recently completed college season to NBA basketball and uh, college basketball. Really any sport, NHL, you name it. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. Make sure to head over there to check out the line for Wolves Pistons on Wednesday. I actually haven't looked yet. But I'm going to guess, and check me on this, I'm going to guess it's Wolves by five on the road in Detroit uh, because the Pistons are on the second night of a back-to-back, and I don't know. That's that's my guess. Um, I think it's five. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at Bet Online too. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, over at NBA.com, uh, they did a mid-season survey of 30 media members. So one media member represented each team. And there actually is only like two Minnesota mentions in here, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So like they ask all these questions like the top 10 teams in the league, which team will make a big second half run, no Minnesota mentions there, who will represent the West in the finals. By the way, the Clippers still won this voting at 34%. I, I have no idea what what we're seeing here with the like i get it ty Lue's a great coach i get it paul george and Kawhi Leonard are still both fantastic but like they don't play the full team together for any more than like you know once a week really if that it's like this weird the way that they are doing things and that how much they've struggled lately like i didn't get it at the beginning of the season i don't get it now i understand in theory they've got a deep roster they've got a good coach i just i don't get it denver was second with 30 percent memphis third with 23 percent golden state still at 10 percent even though they're been hovering around 500 for a while um, who will win the finals, which by the way, only 3% picked the Clippers to win the finals, uh, which is, I think one vote. Um, I don't know. Best play, best game, a bunch of different stuff. No Timberwolves mentions at all until you get all the way down to, as you might expect. I don't think it was phrased as the most, as the biggest disappointment. I think it's phrased as the biggest surprise so far this season. Here it is. What's been the most surprising storyline of the season? Number one, Brooklyn's bounce back. Number two, Sacramento's ascension. Number three, Golden State's inconsistency, which actually I would probably vote for that. The Timberwolves are tied for fourth with Indiana's start. Minnesota struggles at 10%, which is three of 30 votes for the Wolves struggles being the most surprising storyline of the season. The only other mention was related to Gobert being one of the league's best rebounders. I think he got one vote for the best rebounder in the league. That's it. There's nothing Chris Finch in coaching. There's nothing cat anywhere. There's nothing ants anywhere. Um, I guess they didn't ask a lot of like up and coming player questions. They asked some like best player questions, um, best rookies, stuff like that. So not a whole lot of wolves in there at all. Uh, 
but perhaps that's not surprising uh, given how nondescript, like in a lot of ways, it's been nondescript. They're a 500 team, right? Um, as tumultuous as it may seem, as up and down as it seems for a Timberwolves fan and a follower and somebody covering the Timberwolves, uh, like from a national storyline perspective, other than people like laughing at the Wolves giving up a lot for Rudy and then Rudy not playing well, there's not much else to say about a team that's roughly 500. It's just, if you live and breathe Timberwolves, it's been tumultuous, I think is probably the best way to say it. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention before I get to the Pistons preview was there's a midseason report card at uh, NBA.com, and that's done by Michael C. Wright. The Timberwolves predictably have a D in his midseason grades. He talks about their four three-game losing streaks and their six-game losing streak to end December. Uh, talked about Towns missing the last 20 games with no return date in sight, yet they closed the, the first half strong, winning four straight. And then, of course, he says, how Minnesota fares these next 41 games largely depends on the backcourt's continued adjustment to playing alongside Gobert and the return of Towns, which, if you're going to sum up the second half and what's most important, that's it, right? How does the backcourt continue to adjust playing with Gobert, and how and when does Carl Anthony Towns return? And there you have it. I mean, I, I, I'm, my prediction is 43 wins and the 7 or 8 seed in the play-in, or 7, eight seed in, 7 or 8 seed in the Western Conference, as in they'll finish in the play-in. That's my prediction. All right. Uh, let's talk Wolves Pistons. Of course, it was only 10 days ago that the Timberwolves lost to the Pistons at Target Center. I said on that Friday before that fateful loss, the sixth loss in a row for the Wolves, I predicted that it would be a difficult game. I thought they would win, but I said the Pistons are a sneaky, tough matchup for Minnesota. The reason I said that is because their offense isn't nearly as bad as you might expect. Um, they play at a relatively fast pace. They're comfortable playing fast. And they do a really good job of uh, of getting to the free throw line. They're number one in the league in free throw rate. They don't shoot the ball great when they get there, but they get to the free throw line a lot. They play fast. They can make threes. They're middle of the pack in terms of three-point percentage, and they take enough threes. Even with no Cade Cunningham, who, of course, is still out, um, this is a team that can do enough offensively to really – hurt you if you struggle offensively yourself. Now, the Pistons are an atrocious defensive team. They actually just lost on Tuesday night. They gave up 147 points to the Sixers and are now playing on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. So this is a bad defensive team that should be tired and hopefully not super motivated to play on Wednesday. So the Wolves should not have the same issues that they did a, a week and a half ago. The last time the Wolves saw the Pistons, they lost 116 to 104 at target center. They were outscored by 12 in the fourth quarter. This was a tie game. Remember the wolves were actually up in this game by 14 at halftime. The Pistons dominated the third quarter. This was a tie game going to the fourth and the wolves only mustered 16 points in the fourth quarter. They overall scored just 40 points in the second half against the team with the 29th defensive rating, 29th ranked defensive rating in the league. And remember it was the Pistons bench that did all the damage. It was Marvin Bagley. It was Alec Burks. Um, it was, uh, uh, Rodney Magruder was huge for the Pistons. Boyan Bogdanovich had that, I think it was more third quarter for him, but then also a little bit in the fourth quarter. And it was maddening because he was like the one guy that consistently was hurting the wolves and they could not slow him down. Um, so they need Jane McDaniels to stay out of foul trouble. He had a bad game when they played the Pistons. He was three of 11 shooting and had four fouls in 33 minutes. Gobert was very quiet against the Pistons, three shot attempts, nine points. Kyle Anderson did not play well. It was really only Ant that came to the party the last time around. The Wolves bench got completely outclassed by the Pistons bench. All things that can't happen. But remember, the biggest issue was the 15 offensive rebounds that the Pistons got. And uh, that was kind of that was kind of enough. The Wolves turned it over too much. But like it was the second chance points, right? That kind of wore down the Wolves and really hurt them once everything got to the fourth quarter. Um, at the time, Killian Hayes was suspended. He's back and playing for the Pistons. Um, you know, looking at what they did against the Sixers on Tuesday. Uh, they had, uh, let's see, Killian Hayes shot just two of 11 against the Sixers. Sadiq Bey had 17 points, but it took him 14 shots to get there. Kevin Knox in the starting lineup for them. Uh, Bogdanovich actually did not play on Tuesday. I did not realize that he was not playing on Tuesday. I'm going to find out real quick why he didn't play and see if he's going to play against the Wolves on Wednesday. Uh, let's see. The injury report right here. Yeah, the city was out with the calf injury. I did not realize that he was out. So if he does not play, then um, I mean, like the Wolves, I said earlier, I thought they'd be favored by five. They should be favored by more than five. I mean, he played in their last game um, 
before that they've played Philadelphia two consecutive games and, uh, and he played the other night. He just missed Tuesday's game. So if he missed Tuesday, it's a fair assumption to think he might miss Wednesday's game. Uh, but it's the first game that he's missed. So Bogdanovich doesn't play like this should be a, a, an even bigger Timberwolves win. Again, the things to look out for are the Pistons shooting threes, making threes. They're good, but that obviously Bogdanovich doesn't play. That really hurts them in that area. Offensive rebounds for the Pistons. And, um, and free throw attempts getting to the line. I, I mean, the, the, the Pistons are good at getting to the line. Number one in the league at getting to the free throw line. Um, and they're number 12 in offensive rebound rate, which are areas that will struggle defending without fouling and defensive rebounding. Look out for those areas again in this game. And that's especially the defensive rebounding thing. The free throws were fairly even, but the, the defensive rebounding thing was a major issue for the wolves against the Pistons as it has been for much of the season. So Here's hoping the Wolves learn their lesson. Last time they played Detroit, here's hoping they learn their lesson. You know, 72 hours prior when they got down 20 points, like 20 minutes into the game against the lowly Houston Rockets on the road. The Wolves should have learned their lesson. If they come out and play hard against the Pistons Wednesday, they should win. If they don't, they play like they did to start the game against the Rockets on Sunday. They very well could lose this game and, and would actually deserve to lose the game. So, I mean, who knows? Anything could happen, of course. We've seen this against the Pistons, but the Wolves should leave Detroit with a five-game win streak before starting this really, really difficult stretch that starts with Phoenix, who, yes, has struggled a lot, but it's still the Suns. They host Phoenix on Friday night, the start of another kind of brief three-game homestand for the Wolves, uh, but they have Phoenix Friday at home, Saturday night back-to-back, -back, a really tough one against Cleveland, and then a night off before Monday night against Utah. So homestand is Phoenix, Cleveland, Utah. Then they go at Denver next Wednesday, home for Toronto and Houston. So it's a difficult stretch. It's vital for the Wolves to pull back to 500 with the win against the Detroit Pistons on Wednesday, playing the two worst teams in the league in consecutive games. Houston on Sunday, Detroit on Wednesday. You got to win them both. Uh, we'll, of course, go live on the postcast with Marty Gellner. We do that live on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to that channel. Get alerted when we go live. Usually about 45 minutes following the final horn when Marnie's done with her uh, post game on Valley Sports North. And then we'll also do the post game podcast, which we'll post, of course, early on Thursday. So be sure to follow and subscribe to Lockdown Wolves wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube. A big thank you to those of you that do make us your first listen. A reminder, you can also download the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon, and that's with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. One final thank you for making us your first listen. Now make your second listen, the Game to Game NBA podcast. Every moment, every top performance, and every result. Lockdown Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Lockdown can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Lockdown NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.